Hi, I'm Juanito, and today on Modular for the Masses, you can build it video. We're going to build a voltage controlled amplifier. Um, this is one of the most important circuits you can possibly have in your synthesizer. They are, and this particular circuit is going to be a building block for some of the videos I'm going to make uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so it's not too horribly complicated. You can build it, get some parts, get a cheap, crappy soldering iron, and follow along. All right, here's what we have going on. This is a voltage controlled amplifier. There's a picture of me saying what, because it needs to be amplified, the words that are being said by my, by my little logo. This is an LM13700. It's like a regular off amp, but it has a pin that can control the gain of the circuit. I, uh, this is the part of the circuit that will control how much gain the, op, the LM13700 will have. And this particular circuit can do all the way to silence, which is basically minus uh, infinity decibels, to about two times gain, um, which means that if 5 volts plus and minus comes in here, 10 volts plus and minus can come out here with it turned up all the way. That's just kind of useful for overhead if you have really quiet signals coming in um, and if you're working with lower level and you need it to be higher level. Theoretically, this can amplify um, control voltage or attenuate control voltage for that matter. Uh, that is a possibility. There's no capacitors in the signal path. It is a non-inverting amplifier in the sense that this is an inverting amp, but so is this. So it inverts the signal twice. So what goes in here, if it's going up, what comes out here is also going up. Um, the way I have it designed, I have a control voltage in going through a potentiometer to ground, and then the wiper goes here to the, the, um, to the amp that mixes the CV inputs, the CV, the control voltage signals, and one of the inputs is going to go through an, a potentiometer, so you can basically turn down that input. The, the, the potentiometer will be on the panel. Um, there will be a plain old input, which is not attenuated at all and then of course there is a potentiometer on the front for the initial level which goes between positive voltage and ground that means you can use this as a volume control if you have nothing else plugged in um, so you can put audio in audio out and then turn this knob and you'll get basically um, an attenuation or an amplification of your signal that would be way easier to do with a much simpler circuit, so if that's what you're after, <laughs> don't build this. This is only if you want to use a, a voltage to control the amplification of this circuit. The parts we're going to need is the LM13700. That's a transconductance operational amplifier. What goes in is a signal. What comes out is technically not a voltage signal. It's a current signal. If you try to listen to this directly, you won't get anything. If you put a sensitive, um, if you put a sensitive multimeter to this pin right here, you'll get just positive voltage. You won't get anything meaningful. You need to connect it to some kind of circuit to um, convert it from a current into a voltage. These two pins have to do with a Darlington buffer that's on this chip. I don't ever use those. I always use op amps. This also has, this chip also has a pin here and here, which I also never use. They're diodes to prevent the, uh, if you overdrive the inputs, you can mess the circuit up. It won't operate as you might hope. 
so there's diodes in here that hopefully prevent that from happening. But if you attenuate the incoming signal enough, this will work just great the way it is. Um, I designed this circuit with a pretty drastic resistor that's a divider here, 20k input resistor, 100R uh, ground reference resistor. That means the uh, voltages going into here are very small. That reduces distortion. If these numbers are higher, uh, I tried it at 220R, and my sine wave, you know, which is a nice sine wave, what was coming out was more of a round wave, like two semicircles. And that's called distortion. Not like <coughs> that's also called distortion. But anything that is distorting the original waveform is called distortion. So this is a, you know, OTAs, operational transconductance amplifiers, are not super hi-fi. They do add distortion and they also can add some noise. So if you're working with a really high fidelity application, you want to use a purpose-built OTA like a THAT, that. There's also some SSM, I think, uh, purpose-built voltage controlled amplifiers, which are much, much better, much, much easier to build, but they're really expensive. Those chips are like five bucks each, or more, $15 each, depending on where you buy them. So you need an LM13700, you need a TL074, that is a my favorite quad op amp, it has four op amps on one package, fantastic. You need a 2N3906 PNP transistor, and you need a bunch of resistors, and then you need a panel and some jacks, and that should be all you need. So, first I'm going to find my chips. TL074 Something else with this circuit the parts I'm using are dual parts there's four op amps on the circuit on the chips there's only two in the schematic. There's two OTAs per package, and there's only one in the circuit. And what that means is that with these parts, you can build a dual VCA. I'm just going to build one half of a dual VCA. Here's the LM13700. When you buy your parts cheap from China, from AliExpress, woot woot, they frequently come thrown in a bag, <laughs> which doesn't actually mean they don't work. It just means some of the pins are bent sometimes, but I've never, I did buy it a full batch of CD40106 hex Schmidt triggers, and those were almost all faulty. That was highly frustrating. OTA, my TL074 quad op amp. One of the quirks of the TL0074 quad op amp is that the positive pin is on the left, the negative pin is on the right. That's backwards from basically every other uh, microchip you're probably going to use. On the 555, the positive pin's on the right and the negative gr or ground pin's on the left. On all the CMOS chips, the 4 series chips, this is always the positive pin, this is always the negative or ground pin. 
So that requires a little bit of an asymmetrical strategy when you're building a circuit. Another important thing to do right at the outset is to include a bypass capacitor. That's this 100 nanofarad capacitor right here between the positive and the negative pins. But even before I do that, I'm going to break off all the pins I don't need. Keep stuff nice and tidy. The input biasing pin. this little baby. A cool thing about this circuit is that every op amp is an inverting op amp, which means that the input comes into the inverting input and the non-inverting input goes directly to ground. That means these four pins, one, two, three, four, all get to connect to ground. So we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that in a little bit. going to take the power pins of my quad op amp and I'm bend them straight up I'm going to grab some blue tack if you live in the States, and if they have a Dollar Tree near you, you can get a giant chunk of blue tack for a dollar. I mean, it's not name brand blue tack, it's a dollar store brand blue tack. Um, but so it must not have the magical hi fi qualities. I should say audiophile, not hi fi. The magical audiophile qualities that some blue tack seems to have. bypass capacitor seems to be important for every chip. You can put bypass capacitors to ground from the from both of the power um, power pins or you can do them from one power pin to the next. Somewhere I read that it's a good design strategy to put power bypass capacitors between the power rails because that prevents power noise from leaking or from being sent to the ground. Um, you want to keep your grounds nice and clean because your, your circuit in dozens of places will be looking at, will be, will be referenced to ground. And if that ground is wobbling around, then guess what? Your signal is going to be wobbling around too in ways that you do not yeah, I want. Unintended. Keep your leads nice and short. That keeps stray bits of wire from touching other bits of wire and creating surprise connections. All right, so now we have the power bypass capacitor. Again, only ever use ceramic disc capacitors for this purpose. 104 is the magic number. Um, super fantastic. You never need to use a film capacitor or a tantalum capacitor or any kind of exotic technology for power bypassing capacitors. Um, anybody who tells you that I'm wrong is wrong. All right, with this circuit, these are going to be the power pins right here. This is the OTA. And it 
points right there and there. This is minus the, the negative most part of the circuit. This is the positive uh, power rail. And again, they're flipped. So I'm going to take these two and I'm going to arrange them like this. On the right, then, is going to be plus. And on the left of these two pin chips, recognize that not everyone has a bipolar power supply that goes between positive and negative. That is a project for another week, but soon I will show you all how to build a bipolar power supply. Plus 12 volts ground, minus 12 volts. check this. That part is now added to our circuit. I'm going to do the other one too because if you have one uh, 100 nanofarad capacitor that close to both chips, that's good enough. I'll tell you a secret, some circuit builders don't even use bypassing capacitors. It is important, even though some people can get away without using them, it is important because There is, especially some of the CMOS chips that are common in synthesizers, have switching going on inside of them that is very fast and very abrupt. And that fast switching can cause noise to creep out of the, the chip into the rest of the circuit. What I'm doing right now, so anyway, the, the um, capacitor will compensate, we'll get rid of all that noise. What I'm doing now is I'm taking all the positive pins of the TL074 amplifier and I'm bending them together. This is going to be our ground and that will be ground. Nice, solid, fantastic. My circuit doesn't use any diodes or big capacitors, but I need a nice chunky piece of lead for my ground. So I'm going to use a, I bought a bunch of Zener diodes a while back. The only thing I really use them for is for their leads because they're nice and big, nice and thick. Here is a 23.4 volt Zener. <laughs> Who needs a 23.4 volt Zener? I'm sure a lot of people do, but not me. So I cannibalized those leads. This is going to be the ground to this. building something that makes noise, like a voltage-controlled oscillator, or something that drastically changes. When I say noise, I, I mean sound. I don't mean noise. Of course, in that case, too. But if you're making, if you're building a circuit that creates a signal, um, having a star ground is not quite as vital. But if you're create and if you're create if you're building a circuit that changes the sound that comes through it drastically, like a voltage controlled filter, having a really meticulously grounded star ground, a meticulously built star ground, is not terribly important. However, this circuit is not supposed to change the sound that goes in and comes out. 
it's supposed to be as close to a pure, basically a wire with gain. That's what they talk about with super high-end amplifiers. Now, since I'm using an OTA, this is not a high-end amplifier, but we want to get as much as we can out of it. All right, so the outs for the LM13700 are here and here. I'll just be building this half right now, and it goes directly into the negative pin, the inverting pin of this TL074. So I'm going to do it like this. to go to that pin right there, but no, that's not the pin you need to go to. You need to go to that pin, because this pin is the output, and that is the inverting input to the op-amp below it. We will go ahead and snip the that guy. Move that guy out of the way. Alright, that works right there. Output from the TL or from the LM13700 is going straight into the inverting input of the TL074. Now, hey, you know what? If you're building this with me, then let's go ahead and build both halves at the same time. I will only panel, I will only put one of the halves on a panel. but I will build both halves. Both halves of a dual VCA. Um, I'm bending one of these leads back and forth quite a bit. It might get weak, it might break if that happens. It's the easiest thing to create a little jumper from one pin to the next. And in this case, I'm just going to use a little bit of extra solder to coat the whole thing. <laughs> Look at that. I have a little surprise short piece of solder. All right now I'm going to grab 100 ohm resistors and attach them to the inputs of the LM13700 OTA. Keep your leads short. Oh, I love it when I get to do this. I get to get rid of a set of cleaning out. Oh, that's fantastic. So I get to take two things, two scraps of paper out of my small value resistor. off. This is fun because 100 ohms is a symmetrical brown, black, 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 brown. So you can look at it either way and it's the same thing. It's almost 100 ohms. Unless I suppose you have a different tolerance, but I don't, I don't, I don't really know what I'm talking about. I always have to measure or just keep track of what's what. Alright, these are the inputs, the one that's kind of bent like that, and this one. Alright, that's those two. Oh, I'm going to use my short little bit.
a little cold. Method of circuit building that I've never tried is wire mapping. I had a old Heath kit amplifier that somebody built, and many of the interconnects. Well, somebody built all Heath kit amplifiers, I guess. But it was a uh, wire wrapped, and that looks really kind of cool. My point was that that connection right there probably would have been super legit even solder because it was wrapped around there. Bam! 100 R's all going to ground. And of course you will see four 100 ohm resistors because I'm building the two halves. So 100 R, 100 R, and then the two on the other half. Cool. Now it's time. I'm not going to put the input in because all it is is a 20k resistor. You could theoretically add infinite other inputs and then just run it through another 20k resistor and run it to that point. That would be totally cool. But I'm just going to have one audio input. Let's work on the other half of this. We need a 120 picofarad capacitor and a 47k capacitor. That's between the inverting input right there and the output right here. So first let me find 120 picofarad Capacitors. That's going to be one, two, one. I might be able to find one, two, ones, but I don't know. It's not hypercritical. You can get away with slightly different values as long as it's. You know what? I have a bunch of 220 picofarad ca caps. I'll use a couple of these. In fact, I need four because there's capacitors up here as well. But let's concentrate on these right now. 220 picofarad capacitors. One, two, three, four. These are such tiny value caps, and they're not really doing anything signal related. So it's not important that they be high quality ceramic discs are totally fine. All right, Ben, I gotcha. I'll take over now. Cool. I'm at work. Now it's my turn to do bed checks. All right, we're working on these. In fact, you know what? There's 120 picofarad capacitors between the inverting input and the output of all of these capacitors. Again, I'm using 220, which is going to be 222. My bad, 221. Um, but since there's four of them, and there's four that I'm working with, I will do all four right now. Even though, as I said, that's the two halves. You know, that's 
basically I'm building a dual VCA. beginning of this video I talked about some of the circuits that rely on OTAs, I'm, I'm sorry, some of the circuits that rely on VCAs that I'm going to build in the coming weeks. One of them is a wave folder, a Lockhart wave folder. Lockhart is an awesome name, by the way. Reminds me of one of my favorite characters in the Harry Potter universe, Gilderoy Lockhart. Um, hilarious. Bumbling idiot. But anyway, and what a great name. Hundred and twenty pack of ferret. Hundred and twenty pack of ferret. Got those done. I was also going to do the other two. Cause, no, I don't have that one done. I only have that one done. Okay, well, ignore me for just a bit while I solder these in place. Shouldn't be but a moment. Lockhart wave folder takes a wave and turns it into partially an upside down version of itself. Um, it can take a triangle wave and turn it into something that sounds basically exactly like a large V-twin motorcycle engine like a Harley Davidson, a big um, uneven V-twin, and uh, it'll sound like and then you speed it up and it sounds just like a Harley. So, I mean, obviously it works with other kinds of signals too. It'll fold up anything you put through it. It can be very cool when it is voltage controlled. You can get some cool sort of wobble bass kind of sounds out of it. So that'll be one of my upcoming projects. And most of the Lockhart wave folders you find on the internet are not voltage controlled. You just control them with a potentiometer. But I will use one of these circuits to voltage control a Lockhart wave folder. Pretty cool, stay tuned. Alright, now for real, I got 220, well, 121 pike, 120 picofarad capacitors there and there. So one, two, and then on the other side. Now we need a 47 kilo ohm resistor for the current to voltage converting circuit. You can control the gain of this circuit with this capacitor. I mean, my bad, with this resistor. Make make this smaller. For instance, 20k for lower If you want to make it larger for larger gain, that's on you, but 
don't think uh, I, I'm not. I don't think I know how useful that would be. Uh, Vanguard B. This 47k resistor goes between the inverting input and the output. It's going to put it right across there. Keep your leads short. sitting. That's not too bad. Maybe I'll just bend it right there. Tie it into the output there. My tiny little length of solder is throwing me off. It's so weird. My solder is always connected to the spool. you a handy little picture if you have the transistor like this. This is the part with an arrow, this is the base, and this is the part that it's not connected to an arrow. <laughs> like that. There we go. All right. The PNP resistor goes between the IABC pin. I don't know why it's called IABC. That's why that's what it's called in the data data sheet. I stands for current. I know that, but ABC. I don't know what ABC stands for. Let me know in the comments if anybody is actually watching this. All right, this tran this transistor, the part with an arrow, connects to the negative to the inverting input of these amps. The other side that's not connected to an arrow connects to this pin right here, the IABC pin on the top of the OTA. So I need to basically use wire to jump. I'm not going to rely on the leads themselves. That's just too far. Okay. So this is the one that does not have an arrow, and that's the one that connects to the pin right there. Oh, you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to connect the pin with an arrow to the non, I mean, to the inverting input of the amplifier. This is the inverting input of the amplifier.
this pin, the inverting input has a ton of stuff going to it. It has, in my build right here, it's going to have three 20k resistors going to it. It's going to have that 120 picofarad capacitor going to it and the transistor. So I already cut that leg all short. I probably should not have done that. It would have been better to leave it long so I can connect a bunch of other stuff to it. Live and learn. But I will attach it way off to the side to leave lots of room for other pins, for other leads to come in and attach. In my experience, transistors have some of the most difficult to solder to leads to get a really nice, reliable link, uh, connection. All right, the base goes to the output through a 20k resistor. So I'm grabbing a 20k resistor. I'm going to grab two. And I'm put another little bandolier out here. 20k resistors because I'm going to use a bunch of them. This output doesn't connect to anything else besides the 20k resistor and the 120 picofarad capacitor that's already connected to it. So once I connect this 20k resistor to it, that pin is finished. The other end of the, that, 20, that particular 20k resistor goes to the base of the transistor. Shortening my leads. Yep. Now this goes to that pin. Um, I'm not going to run it through just a bare lead. I'm going to use a piece of orange wire. ABC pins, you are getting shorter. <sighs> shorter pins, it's so sad. <laughs> I will overcome. Some wire is harder to solder to than others, harder to get it wet. If you feel like having a little tub of flux sitting near your workstation, hey, great, go ahead and do that. Dip stubborn bits of work, whether it's transistor leads or wire that you don't know where it came from, and it might be might have been sitting in a warehouse, humid, hot, and might have corroded a little bit, and be hard to solder to. Hey, dip that wire into some flux, 
that will magically make it so easy to solder to. I have a little bucket of flux in my soldering kit, but I never use it. That's not true, I do use it. I use it when it's super hard to get my um, tip tinned, and I use it when I'm soldering transistor wire or headphones wire that is very, that has a coating on it. The flux will help burn off the coating. Nope, oh, got to do budget. transistor, same as the other side, goes through a 20K resistor to the output of this particular op amp. You'll notice that the sides look different. The flat face of the transistor is facing up in this case, and on the other side, the flat face is facing down. The rounded part of the transistor is facing up. That's because transistors, you know, they're not symmetrical. Here's my other 20K resistor. Clip it nice and short. This 20K resistor goes to the output.
send it. lead-free solder paste. This is for plumbing, usually. But it works great for electronics, too. It might be extra acidic and really, really bad for soldering iron tips. <laughs> but I don't care because um, I just don't care about my soldering iron tip. As I touch this, it's going to hiss and sizzle, and it will wet. There we go. Goodbye, flux. Get the flux out of here. Bam. I pseudo squared. The other thing about flux is it's messy. right here. We need to put the output right here. 
besides that, we are set. Now I pulled, a, took a page from those cooking shows, and I made a tin can lid. It says portamento because this is an old module lid. Uh, I'm not actually going to use it as a. Well, it was a portamento circuit. My circuit calls for two 100k potentiometers. These seal potentiometers are really, really nice. They're high quality. They're super um, solid, very confidence inspiring. They are sealed, which means if you do choose to clean your socket off, I mean your circuit off with some kind of solvent, you're not going to drive anything inside the mechanics of this potentiometer. They are dual gang potentiometers, which means if you want to use one of them as a stereo potentiometer to control the levels of a stereo signal, they'll work great. If you want to buy a 100k potentiometer and you need a 2 or a 50k potentiometer, you can just bend the pins and make them all touch and bang, you just build yourself a 50k uh, potentiometer. I don't use them as often because the sort of damping on the action is higher than I like. I like my ultra cheap circuit like snapping uh, potentiometers because they're so quick. But at the same time, they're not very confidence inspiring because they wobble like the bearings going out or something. They just seem low quality. And they're about as. These are about 20 cents each, and my other ones are about 10 cents. So they're half the price. The cheap ones are half the price. Alright, here's my two 100K potentiometers mounted up. They're both connected to ground. Now I have to turn it and imagine the slider of the wiper inside going over there to high and over there to ground. Over there to high, over there to low. So that's going to be connected to the positive rail or the CVA in jack, or it's going to be connected to ground over here. So these two pins are here. Same with the other potentiometer, right here, go to ground. I found in a scrap, oop, we'll be right back. Commercial break. local um, crazy business was going out of sale. They had boxes and boxes of electronic components and crazy things that didn't seem to, or whose purpose was lost to history. And I bought a bunch of rainbow wire 
which is not actually rainbow, it's more like the resistor color code. Um, because there's no black in a rainbow. But the resistor color codes do have black. So I bought a bunch of that stuff and it's great, I recommend it. It's easy to keep track of wires when they're going hither and yon in a point-to-point -point circuit. Uh, if they're all gray, ground wires. Let's get some of the input jacks. This input jack will connect straight to the high side of this potentiometer because that's good. Put it over there. Okay, fine. I'm gonna put it over there. When you're looking at the front of a panel and the back of a panel, same as when you're looking at the front of the, or the top of a PCB and the underneath of a PCB, um, you have to flip everything in your brain, and that can be challenging. It can create, especially if you're not working with a printed circuit board, you're working with a perf board or strip board or something that can lead to some confusion. The land of confusion, as some people like to say. Peter Gabriel. Wait. Phil Collins. Genesis. I need some hookup wire. How about a little bit of blue? This is going to be the CVA input. This is going to be the CVB input, as shown right here and here. They both have a 20k resistor going to the sort of zero point of this inverting amp. Of this amp. It's not really an inverting amp because it doesn't have that kind of feedback loop. But we can add, we can sum lots of uh, connections right there. That's the way it works. So this goes to the high side of the potentiometer. Nice and strong. Then it goes right to the input jack, which it looks like I cut it on purpose to this length, <laughs> but I didn't. It's just uh, providential. Something important when you're building point-to-point -point freeform airboarding is you don't want to wiggle around too much. 
much once you have your part nice and set and where it needs to go. I'm going to let go of it, let the solder cool, try to stay perfectly still until it's fully cool. That does look a little bit cold. drawback of these little sealed potentiometers is that the leads are not super, super strong. So you really don't want to flex them any more than you have to. Um, I'm gonna... This is not permanent. If I was building this permanently, I would definitely not trust this chunk of circuitry to 
reliably mount to one potentiometer pin because every time it wiggles and vibrates it's going to be flexing that pin and eventually that pin would break. Um, it's also not the best positioning right now because look at how close it is to the output. So anyway, we'll just roll with it for now. When you're building this on your own, you should definitely make a different choice, a different choice for your permanent module. Be right back. Geometers have the low side connected to ground. This black wire, I'm going to tie this black wire to the panel right there. That's a nice, reliable ground. circuit would be higher gain. But do not do that. If you need to make it higher gain, change this resistor right here because, um, because if you increase, if you make this resistor a smaller value like 10k, it increases the distortion of this OTA. I already talked about that. I just wanted to talk about it again.
converting input of the OTA. jack because these TL074 um, op amps are rated to have the outputs shorted to ground infinitely. You can do it forever. It won't burn up. It'll get hot, but it won't burn up. It won't damage it. But if you connect this output to a positive voltage, like straight to the rail, the positive rail, and it's trying its very hardest to output the lowest you know, the negative rail voltage, you're probably looking at a burned up op amp. So 100 ohms resistance, 200, 300, 680 ohm resistance, it's probably a good idea. Go ahead and include that in there. Alright, this needs to connect to the output of this op amp, which is this one right here with a 47k resistor between the negative pin and the output pin. Just gonna run it straight like that. And then guess what? This circuit is almost done. <laughs> I was gonna say it's done, but I forgot to run the power wires. chip we're looking at is the LM13700. See the notch right there? That means that's north. So then I know that this side of the chip is positive. So pin number, uh, what is that, 11? I don't know what number pin that is, but that is positive. And here I am in my hand holding the, 
negative cable. So I'm going to go ahead and hold the red one. strip the ends of the power wire. I'm going to check off all of the components on my schematic. And then we're going to go plug this into my synthesizer. Yep. 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 Thumbs up. Fantastic. Okay, here's my synthesizer, and here is my power rail that goes in from, it goes into the back of my synth. So let me connect the power rail to the module. orange to red because that's the positive this is going to be the ground ground in my circuit is black, ground in my synthesizer is white. Ground in the, or the negative rail in the circuit and in my synthesizer is green. Cool. Here's some electrical tape to insulate my power wires. We don't want there to be short circuits. This is just temporary, so I'm not going to do a very good job. When you're powering up your circuit for the first time, you want to make sure that any conductive bits like solder 
or discarded leads or cut off bits of scrap wire or tin can <laughs> pieces of tin can or if you're using something besides tin cans bits of scrap metal are not sitting on your bench waiting to make a surprise connection between different parts. Ooh, I forgot one very important thing. I forgot to connect this potentiometer to the positive rail. So I'm going to hit pause. Okay, basically having me forget to attach the other end of the potentiometer to the positive rail kind of ruins the whole circuit because it wouldn't work as it intended without it being connected. So I'll try to figure out how to put a little comment inside the video at that point saying, hey, make sure you attach the high end of the potentiometer to the positive rail <sighs> because otherwise the initial um, the initial setting on your front panel will not work. It won't do anything. There we go. Alright. I'm going to unplug my soldering iron so I can get it out of the way. Stop making it crowded up here. And then I'm going to turn it on. If this explodes, uh, you won't be watching this video. No explosion. Doesn't smell like magic smoke. All right. I'm taking off my lavalier microphone. we just finished. Here's the VCA we just finished. Oh my word, you can't see anything, can you? I'm going to plug in the sawtooth wave right there. Here's another patch cable to the out. I'm going to plug the other end in to the Mixer and turn it up. Okay, this should be the initial, and this should be the attenuation of the signal coming in here the control voltage signal. So let's try the attenuation. All right, that works. Now, what I need to do is get an LFO source. LFO stands for Low Frequency Oscillation. Here's my bare steel LFO. I'll plug that in. And I will plug the other end of the bare steel LFO right into the 
attenuated input. This is the um, this is the CV now. All right, so let's plug it into the. All right, this is kind of cool. So you can make a sound have some kind of an FM to it, like a frequency modulation, by making it louder and quieter, amplitude modulating, well, it's not FM, it's AM. So it's amplitude modulating it with some other, um, with some other voltage. This wire right here has a different voltage going into it. I'm going to use that for this to pitch this. It's going to form a sequencer to pitch this. All right, the bass frequency is not changing because it's coming from here, or the basic frequency, the frequency underneath. The pitch changing is coming from this, which is amplitude modulating the sound going through it. We can change this. Use the triangle wave. Use some chunky square wave. Use the sine wave. Slow it down enough, it becomes vibrato or tremolo. Is it skipping like that? Oh, there we go. All right. Works great, everybody. Build it yourself. You can do it. Hit like and subscribe and that stupid little bell that everybody says you should. Okay, I thought it was done, but let me talk a little bit more about BCAs. BCAs are super important. They're really, really good for so many things that you can do with a modular synthesizer. Some people say you can never have enough VCAs. You can get away without VCAs if you're willing to use other things like low-pass gates or low-pass filters um, as a VCA, um, but there really is... Uh, a lot of plus sides, a lot of upsides. Now, tutorials about how to use VCAs, that's not what I wanted to cover in this video at all. So the only experimentation I did with it was that sort of tremolo or amplitude modulation of one wave by another. So let me go through how we can simplify this circuit if you just want to get a bunch of VCAs in your system. Um, Plug it in, ready. Okay. The attenuator for the CV in, you can eliminate that if you want. The, you can just use a straight CV in and that'll be okay. You can even eliminate the initial level if you want a basic, simple VCA that has an in, a gain sort of thing, and an out, controlled by voltage. Um, if that's all you're after, then skip these parts.
Okay, so, sorry, I'm back. My synthesizer has, uh, I think, 10 VCAs, and they're all dual VCAs, and they're all basic. They have an in and out and a sort of a gain, uh, control voltage setting. So you can get away with that. That's cool. But having these features really can help. You can do interesting things. You can, uh, yeah, use it for lots of different stuff. So, I encourage you to build this. All right, Juanito out.